morning. 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 Good to be with you. Can I use this mic? Kurt. Uh, is it on? This mic on? Can you hear me? Yeah. It is great to be with you. I always love coming uh, back to New Life and sharing the word with you. And uh, New Life will always have a very special place in my heart and in my life. Uh, I remember the year when we spent together uh, sharing the word and growing together, and uh, I have not forgot that time. In the past year, I have been working on a new course for Global Training Network in Africa. Uh, I have taken this course from Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where the Lord Jesus gave us a promise. And the promise was, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. From that passage, I have spent the last year just working on a new course that we have uh, entitled The Miraculous Church, the church that Jesus is building. Now when we talk about the church, I have enough here to walk. <laughs> when we talk about the church, what comes to your mind? When you hear that word, church, what comes to your mind? The family of God. Family of God. Body of believers. Body of believers. How big is that body? Well, it's a global family. Oftentimes when we think of the church, we think of New Life Fellowship, or Grant E. Free, or the Methodist Church around the corner. Uh, that is a part of the family of God. But Paul defined the church in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, when he said, great, we'll try and get hooked up. Okay, can you hear that? First Corinthians 12, 13, the Apostle Paul said, For by one spirit were we baptized into one body. Whether we're Jew or Greek or bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. Definition of the church, doctrinally, is found there. A church that is greater than one people group. <clears throat> a church that is made up of both Jew and Gentile. Uh, but when you think about the church, do you think of it as a miraculous body of believers? Oftentimes we think of the church as a religious organization. It's much more than that, according to the Word of God. We think of it as a place of fellowship, and it is. We think of it very locally, and yet it is bigger than that. And so today, I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we will begin to see some of the pillars or foundations of what makes the church the church that Jesus is building. I believe somehow we have lost the vision of what that church is to look like. In America, I think it is true. I think in Africa, I know it is true. Uh, often in these places, we have looked at the church as an organization rather than an organism. That which is alive that which is empowered by God, that which is much more <clears throat> than a denomination, <clears throat> that which is much more 
than a social group that gets together who love Jesus. It's more than that. It is a miraculous work of God, a sovereign work of God, of Him taking sinners like you and me from every nation in all of the world and binding them together by one Holy Spirit to be one holy body called church. Now in the Old Testament, God had worked for a nation, the nation of Israel. We read about that, at least in part, uh, in the life of Abraham. God gave Abraham a promise in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, Genesis 17. God gave a promise to Abraham that out of him one would come who would be a blessing to who? Who would the blessing be to that God promised Abraham? To all nations. To all nations. He said that out of you one will come who will be a blessing to all nations. Jesus Christ came. He fulfilled that promise of Abraham that was given to Abraham. And for three years of earthly ministry, Jesus began to prepare for one of the most miraculous things that would ever happen on planet Earth. He began to prepare to plant the church. Now, there's a great deal being said today in our world and missions on planting churches. Global Training Network is going to begin as an extension of our ministry to plant churches this next year. We have added to our curriculum of theology a church planting curriculum to try and help uh, <clears throat> expand the kingdom of God in Uganda and Rwanda and Congo where we have the joy of ministry. But when we began to think about church planting, we began to look at all that has been written. There is a tremendous amount of material that has been written about church planting, uh, mainly in America. Uh, when I was a pastor uh, in Arizona, I had the joy of being involved in planting churches out of a mother church. And we saw God do some great things. But I look back on that experience in my own life and recognize we did not always go back to the right model. Often we read the latest book on how to plant a successful church in America. Now they have many good things, uh, many good methods, ideas, but very few of them went back to the life of the Lord Jesus, who was preparing to launch the miraculous church on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> very few went back and found out how did he prepare in those three years to plant a dynamic <coughs> witness in the world that would expand the sovereign kingdom of God. So in this last year, I have spent a great deal of time going back to the Gospels and looking at principles and methods that Jesus used to prepare for Pentecost. How did he prepare leadership? Who did he select to plant that new church? What was his message in that three years that he would command in the Great Commission to be spoken in that church? You know, in the Great Commission, Jesus said, since you're going into all the world, now this is just as he is getting ready to ascend back into heaven. He's been to Calvary. He's been through the empty tomb. He has spent another 40 days on the earth. Now he's ready to go back to heaven. And before he goes, he gives what we call the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. And he said, since you are going into all the world, by the way, grammatically, that's exactly how it is written. It's not a command to go. 
It's written in a manner that says, since you're going, <laughs> that Jesus took for granted because of what he has taught for three years that his disciples, not just the 12, but the 120 at least, that were in the upper room the day of Pentecost, that they would understand that they should be going. So he says, since you're going, make disciples of all nations. <coughs> make followers of me. That's the only command in the Great Commission. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. But then he said this, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. He was preparing in those three years his disciples to know the message, the message that he wanted his church to take into all the world. So <clears throat> the church is miraculous. When you, go, when you go to the book of Acts and you begin to see the, uh, how the church was birthed, it was miraculous. Everything about it was miraculous. Now when we use the word miraculous, that word is thrown around today very lightly. Uh, even in athletics, you will hear people say, oh, that was a miracle. That catch was a miracle. It wasn't a miracle. From a biblical standpoint, the word miracle means that which you cannot explain apart from God. If God doesn't do it, it won't get done. The church was a miracle. Pentecost could not happen unless God had intervened, unless God had shown up in all of his power, in all of his omnipotent power. It was a miracle. You cannot explain what happened at Pentecost apart from God. God did it. God was planting a new voice in the world. Israel had been ordained and chosen and set aside for 4,000 years to be the voice of God. Were they the voice of God? At times they were the voice of God. But if you go through the Old Testament and especially read the prophets and the historical books in the Old Testament, you find that God was constantly having to say to them, return, come back, repent. Don't run after other gods. Do not be immoral. Uh, the church of the Old Testament, we might call it that. Though there is a great difference between church and Israel. But that's another whole <laughs> that's another whole message. That's a part of the course we wrote because many people today have mixed up the promises that were given to Israel as though they are the promises that were given to the church. And many of them are not. God called out a people for his own name. He called them to be the people of God. But in the Old Testament, he's constantly having to say, come back, return, repent. But on the day of Pentecost, God brings an exclamation mark to three years of preparation. Three years of preparation of going to the cross, of going to the resurrection. But don't stop at the resurrection. God was not done. God was laying the foundation for the message that was to be declared. <laughs> the message of the cross. The atoning work of Christ. The sacrificial atoning work of Christ on the cross. The message of the resurrection. By the way, if you stop at the cross, you do not have the gospel. That is not the message Christ came to send to the world. It was not simply the cross. In Africa, when we study soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, we talk about the gospel. 
We make sure the gospel is defined according to the word of God, not according to religious ideology. What does the word of God say? And I constantly am saying to our African brothers, if you only have the cross, you have half a gospel. If you're standing at the cross and you have not taken one step beyond the cross, you do not have the gospel. The whole gospel is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. Paul makes that clear in Romans chapter 6. But do not even stop at the resurrection. Those are unbelievably wonderful truths. And they need to be taught today. The gospel of the cross needs to be taught. The gospel of the empty tomb needs to be taught. But don't stop there. When you go to John chapter 14 through John 17, you will find that Jesus gave promises about the church. He was promising a new relationship of God to God's people. If you went back, and we won't today, but let, just let me make this reference. In John 14, verse 16, Jesus said, I'm going to send another just like me. And he identifies that another as the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus is saying this just the night before he will be arrested and then go to the cross. He said, I'm going to send another and he's just like me. That word another in the Greek language means another just like the same that was before me. And he identifies that another as the Holy Spirit. But then he says a very important thing. He makes a distinction in that passage between the Holy Spirit's relationship to the people of God in the Old Testament and a new relationship that is about to occur on the day of Pentecost. And he said, that Holy Spirit who has been with you now will be what? Do you know? You. Now he will be in you. And he didn't stop there. He said he will be in you forever. In other words, Jesus was saying, the Holy Spirit is not just going to come and walk with you any longer. He's going to walk in you. He's not just going to impress upon you what you should say or what you should think or how you should act. But he is now going to dwell in you through the resurrected power of Christ. He's going to dwell in you to speak through you, think through you, look at the world through you as he looks at the world. Why is that important? Because Jesus was preparing for the miracle of the church. That which would be new. Israel lived under an old covenant, the covenant of the law. Was it a good covenant? Absolutely. Was it a divine covenant? Absolutely. Paul says in Galatians, if we didn't have the law, we would have not known how sinful we are. You know what he was really saying? If we didn't have the law, we wouldn't know we needed a Savior. The law was good. The law was holy. But the Jews missed what the law was for. The law was to bring them to Christ as sinners who could not save themselves. So on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, a miraculous thing happened. God fulfilled the promise of John 14. The Holy Spirit came. He came in great power. He came with power that could not humanly be explained. Now, the Holy Spirit came with signs and wonders, and it was a miraculous day. Many are saying today in the church, we need another Pentecost. No, we don't need another Pentecost. 
It's like saying we need another cross of Calvary. No, at Calvary, Jesus said, it is finished. At Pentecost, God did it once for all, never to need to do that again. He was laying the same foundation for the church like he laid the foundation on Mount Sinai for the Jews with the law. How many times did he duplicate that? Never again. But he, when he introduced it, he introduced it with signs and wonders and a miraculous, made it a, a miraculous event. So it was with Pentecost. Pentecost was a miraculous thing. If you read the message of Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, it is one of the most powerful messages you will read in the scripture. Now this is the same Peter who just a few days before had denied the Lord Jesus not once, but had denied him three times. That same Peter who went out and wept in shame becomes the apostle that God did a miraculous work in and he could declare this wonderful gospel. Now that same Peter is the one that we find speaking these words in the text of 1 Peter chapter 1. He's going to talk about the miracle of the church. And, and in this passage, when we read it, you're going to see there's about five messages in this passage. There's a lot of great material. But I'm going to zero in on just one. One aspect of the miracle of the church. That church which Jesus is building. Now here's the question, and I want you to be thinking of this question as we go through this portion of the Word of God. Are we building the church that Jesus said he would build? Are we partnering with the foundation and the head of the church so that the church becomes a reflection and a demonstration in our world of what Jesus Christ is like and what his message is. Are we building it his way? Or have we substituted other things? Have we substituted programs and personalities? Have we substituted other things? I believe often we have. And it is a refreshing thing to come back and a renewal kind of truth to come back to the Word of God and deliberately look at the message that the church is supposed to be giving today and how the church is to operate if we are honestly saying we are involved in the church Jesus is building. You and I building the church? Not going to happen. There's only one who can build the church. That's Jesus. Now he has chosen to dwell within you and me. If you went back to John 14, went down to verse 19, you would hear Jesus say, not only will the Holy Spirit dwell in you, but I will dwell in you. And he wants to release his life through the church today. The church made up of you and me. We are the church. My African brothers, 400 strong students of the Word of God in Africa now. They are the church. They're not only the church. They are the church. Connected to you. Connected to me. Connected to believers all over the world, as we began this message in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, makes very clear. Now, there are many things about the miracle of the church that we could talk about today, but I'm just taking one. We could talk about the miraculous birth. 
We could talk about the miraculous authority. We could talk about the miraculous message. We could talk about the miraculous leadership. We could talk about the miraculous mission of the church. And on and on. There's so much about the church that is miraculous. But today I just want to talk about one. The miracle of love. The miraculous love of the church. And Peter identifies this with at least three pillars of that love that the church should be operating in. Let me just read, beginning in verse 1 through verse 9. And while we're reading this in 1 Peter chapter 1, I want you to be looking. Look at the text. Don't just listen to me read it. Look at the text. And see if you can identify some of the pillars of this miraculous church that Peter identifies. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pil pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if in need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you what? What does it say? Having not seen, you what? Love. Mm -hmm. Having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. Uh, the salvation of your souls. This passage, in order to really appreciate it, you need to understand a little bit of the setting of this passage. This passage was written about 30 years, 35 years, after the death of Christ. <coughs> Peter had become an apostle to the Jews. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. They both ministered to both groups. But the singular focus of Peter was on the Jews. In 64 AD, Rome was burned to the ground. Historians tell us Nero, really, the emperor of Rome, is the one who set the fire. He was obsessed with building more buildings, more monuments to himself. And so he burned his own city to the ground. And of course the Romans then uh, were after him. <laughs> and so to deflect uh, the attention from himself he accused Christians of burning Rome. If you go back and study history of that period of time, you will read things like Nero crucified thousands of Christians 
he lined their crosses on both sides of the road of entering into Rome. And he would light them on fire at night with Christians hanging on the cross. Peter would eventually die on one of those crosses. History tells us that Peter requested that he would be crucified upside down because he felt he was not worthy to be crucified in the same manner that his Savior, the Lord Jesus, was. Now you will not find that in the scripture, but history seems to bear it out that that is exactly what happened. Peter watched his own wife burned on a cross. That is the setting of First and Second Peter. Peter is writing to them to encourage them. In verse 1 he calls them the pilgrims of the dispersion. That just means Christians who had been scattered all over the world. I have the joy of ministering in Africa in countries where there has been great wars and genocide in the past. In 1994 in Rwanda, over a million out of seven million people in Rwanda were brutally slaughtered through a genocide. You know what happened when that was going on? If Eric was here, who you met, some of you met, our country coordinators in Rwanda, he could share with you one of the things that happened is that people began to be dispersed. <laughs> they began to scatter because of the persecution that was in their land and the war that had risen, and it was such a, a, a butchery kind of war. The instrument, the preferred instrument of war was a machete, which gives you just a feel of what that was like. But what happened? People began to run. Eric told me his family, they ran to Burundi. Half of his family was lost in the genocide. He survived with an aunt and an uncle who went across the border, just like is what is happening here in 1 Peter. So the Jews, because of persecution, began to scatter. Was God in that? <laughs> Absolutely. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, you find out there were Jews from every nation under heaven that were gathered for the Passover, and there they were. And Jesus had said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses. When the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses where? Where did he say they would be witnesses? Everywhere. Well, before they went everywhere, he began with Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the uttermost of the parts of the world. But when you read the book of Acts, you don't see that dispersion until you get to chapter 8. When you get to chapter 8 and on, you see the persecution coming. The church is being persecuted by Rome. People are dying for their faith. And because of it, they begin to go to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Don't let anybody tell you the devil was in charge of all of that that was going on. Certainly the devil was taking advantage of a situation, but it was God, Almighty God, who had put this sovereign plan in place before the foundation of the world that on the day of Pentecost there would be those from every nation who would be there and they would hear the wonderful word of God in their own language. Where did those people go? After Passover, where did most of those people go? They went back to the uttermost parts of the earth. What did they take with them? They took with them the new gospel, the new covenant between sinners and God. When the persecution came, 
those who were huddled in their little holy huddles in Jerusalem suddenly began to run for their lives. And where did they run? They ran to all of those cities that you read about in the New Testament epistles. They ran to Corinth. They ran to Ephesus. They ran to Philippi. They ran to Thessalonica. They ran to the seven uh, cities of Asia that you read about in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Where the Lord Jesus, the head of the church, brought a message to the church of that which he loved in the church and that which he hated in the church. So Peter, that same Peter, gives us our text today. We begin in verses 3 to 5, the miraculous love was a pillar of hope. Look at these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living, what? Hope. I don't care if you look up here another moment. I just want you to look at the text. This is the breath of God. This is the Word of God. This is the living Word of God. This is the Word that will transform my life and yours. So follow the text. So he says, this sounds like Ephesians chapter 1, doesn't it? Remember Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And then he gives the rest of the chapter to defining all of those blessings. Sounds a lot like that, doesn't it? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us. He has caused us to be born anew. Born again. That's what the word begotten means. We have been born again in this new entity called church to a living hope. The message of the church should be a message of hope. I was interested in reading your insert in the bulletin today about hell. Whoever put that together, and I assume it was Pastor John, put that together. He picked the right guy to quote. Uh, the man he quotes there uh, said it right. That hell ought to cause us to recognize the love of God. We look at hell oftentimes as a very... Uh, dark and ugly and uh, unappealing subject to talk about. It is all of that. But as a believer, if you understand the miracle of the love of God, you'll begin to recognize Jesus talked more about hell than he ever talked about heaven. But his purpose was to show, to warn men, but it was also to demonstrate the greatness of his love. If you want to know something is great, then contrast it to something that is less. When Jesus talks about hell, if you will look at the context in which he does so, he is comparing it to the very love that he has for sinners. God never prepared hell for man. He was prepared for the devil and his angels. People say, how can a loving God send people to hell? He doesn't. He doesn't. He never prepared it for you and me to go there. If I went to hell, it isn't God who sends me to hell. I have chosen not to go to heaven. I have chosen not to come the way of the cross. 
I have chosen not to drink from the mercy and the grace of God. That's what Peter is saying. He's saying, this new work God is doing through the cross, through the empty tomb, through Pentecost, gives the church a pillar, a pillar of hope. Do you live with hope? Now, we live in a wild world, don't we? Crazy world. Politically insane. Socially unbelievable. I don't know how many people I've heard just in the last few weeks say, can you believe that we're hearing some of the things that are now being acceptable in America? That we never would have accepted. We never would have even spoke about these things in public even 10, 15, 20 years ago. Unbelievable. And it has caused many people, even in the church, to walk without hope. Many people today are praying for the second coming of Christ, not so they can see the Lord Jesus face to face, but so they can be, de be delivered from this dark and sinful world. That's wrong motive. <laughs> Paul says in first. Thessalonians chapter 4. Listen, seeing all this is going to happen, comfort one another with these words. In other words, have hope. Our hope is not in our politics. Our, thank God for that. Amen. <laughs> our hope is not in government. Our hope is not in a denomination. Our hope is not in social justice. Our hope must be only in the mercy of and the grace of God. But that's only possible because of the miraculous love that brings us hope. Look at the things he says. This miraculous love in verses 3 to 5, it's based on the abundant mercy of God. That's hope. <laughs> that's a foundation. That's a pillar for hope. He didn't just say, I, yeah, I like you. I think you're a good lady. I like you. No. No, God came with abundant mercy. Why? Because it was required. We have abundant sin in our lives. We are born alienated from God, an enemy of God, separated from God, dead in our trespasses and sins, according to Ephesians 2. We had a great need. We had no hope. In fact, Paul says, before Christ, we were without hope and without Christ in this world. But Christ came. And He not only died on a cross and bore our sins and took our place and became our substitute, He not only rose from the dead, in order to give us life so He could live within us of His victorious life. But He gave us the church. He gave us the miraculous body of Christ. And with that church came a miraculous love that gave us hope. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in the abundant mercy and the abundant grace of God. Our hope is in the resurrection of Christ. By the way, I challenge you, when you read the epistles, and usually within the first chapter of almost every epistle in the New Testament, you will read about the resurrection. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, Paul says, I am praying for you. And one of the things I'm praying for you is that you might know the exceeding greatness of His power, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Constantly is talking about the resurrection. We do not talk about the resurrection enough. We wait until Easter to talk about the resurrection. Listen, there is no abundant 
a life in Christ without the resurrection. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it how? Abundantly, Abundantly overflowing, pulsating from every pore of your being. <laughs> that kind of abundant life. Listen, that's where hope is. But you do not have that hope <coughs> without the miraculous church. It's a miracle. <laughs> it is. He said that what you receive in the message of the church is a salvation that is incorruptible, undefiled. That will bring security for eternal salvation. That's hope. Our hope is in nothing less than Jesus' blood and what? Righteousness. <laughs> That's where our hope is. The miraculous love of God is found in the pillar of hope. Secondly, look at verses 6 to 8. The miraculous love of God is a pillar of faith. Peter addresses their persecution in this passage. And I don't have time to go through all of that. But you see it in this passage. Look at verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. There's the persecution he's talking about. That in the genuineness of your what? Faith. Faith. Being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, your faith is being tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory of the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him. That sounds like Hebrews chapter 11. All of those who died in the Old Testament looking towards the cross. They died having not seen the promises fulfilled that they were given about a coming Christ. He says, whom having not seen, verse 8, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, that's faith, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your what? Faith. The miraculous love of the church has a pillar of faith. <coughs> Hope, yes, but faith. Now think of these words, what he said. Do not just, you know, buzz by these words. Whom having not seen, you loved. Though now you do not see him, yet you believe. <laughs> do we walk by faith? Only if you believe in the church. The church is the foundation that Jesus laid, which is the foundation of faith. It is the pillar of our salvation. Paul says, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, says, without faith, it is what? impossible to please God for he that cometh to God must believe that he is that God is all that is revealed himself to be and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him faith is a must in the church 
You do not find faith in religion. You do not find faith in socialism. You do not find faith in government. You find faith alone in Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, those familiar verses, for by grace are you saved through what? Faith. Faith. And that faith, it's not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. pillar of faith is only available because of the miraculous love of God expressed in church. The Pharisees live by sight. Most of the Old Testament, even saints, live by sight. They did not live by faith. Faith came by hearing the word of God. And where do you hear the Word of God? You hear the Word of God in the miraculous church. And the love of God, that is miraculous. It is miraculous, you know, that love. God commended His love, Romans 5 eight. God commended His love. He demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were what? Sinners. Yet sinners. Christ died for us. It's that kind of love. But that kind of love is connected to church. It's connected to God's family. It's connected to the single instrument God will use in the world to expand the kingdom of God. There is no other substitute for the church. There is no substitute for the message of hope, for the message of faith. And finally in this passage, the message of joy and glory. Look at verse 8 again. Whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you do what? Rejoice. You rejoice. <laughs> you rejoice. What is the foundation of our joy? It's the message of the church. It's not the message of religion. Religion is separate.